this is a Pinewood Derby car. It comes in a kit, then you build it and put it together, and then it uses gravity to go down a track. So over 100 million of these cars have been built and raised by kids over the past 60 years. Which means over 100 million dads have spent a lot of time at the workbench and then subsequently pretended their kid helped in some meaningful way. But don't feel bad for the boys because someday they'll grow up to be dads and then they'll get a chance to work on a car of their very own. Now this is a much faster Pinewood Derby car. Oh wait, this was my entry. I was disqualified because apparently using jet propulsion goes against the spirit of the competition. Let's roll! <laughs> This is a much faster legal car. But what is it about this one that makes it so much faster than this one? I mean, really, is it the wheels? Is it the weight placement? Is it the axles? And of the design features that influence speed, which one of those is the most important? For example, do aerodynamics really play a role? So today, we're gonna use cold hard science to figure out how you can maximize your chance of taking home the trophy with the least amount of effort. There are a lot of opinions on how you build a fast car, and spoiler alert, some of the most popular ones are completely false. And at the end of the video, to prove science is in fact true, I'll show you a car I built in 45 minutes based on what I learned, and then show you how it did in competition. So let's start with the fundamentals. The Pinewood Derby is all about conservation of energy. The amount of energy you start the race with is the same amount of energy you end the race with. It's just a different kind. So each of these blocks represents a unit of energy. So at the beginning of the race, it's all potential energy, which is the energy associated with height. So when you start, the higher your center of mass is on the track, the more of it you have. And then at the end of the race, in a perfect world, all that potential energy has been converted to kinetic energy, block for block. And kinetic energy is the energy of speed. So you were really high on the track, and as you came down, all that height was converted into speed. And you notice I said in a perfect world, because in reality, we lose some of that kinetic energy to friction. It's dissipated through heat. But you will notice that these two piles of friction and kinetic energy still add up to the original potential energy we started with. Energy is conserved. So if you can reduce friction, that means you're going to have more kinetic energy. And that is the key. This pile is the key to winning the race because it has the speed term in there. And whoever has the higher pile of blocks here wins the race every time. So for the rest of this video, we're gonna discuss what truly matters in maximizing your kinetic energy or your speed or this pile. How do you make this pile as big as possible with the least amount of effort? Okay, so before we go any further, I wanna introduce you to someone I met while doing the research for building the perfect Pinewood Derby car. My name is Scott Act, and I'm a physicist for Ball Aerospace. About 10 years ago, my son and I kicked my wife's car out of the garage and we converted it into the Pinewood Derby Research Facility. For almost a year, we conducted experiments and used the laws of physics to determine exactly what it takes to make a winning Pinewood Derby race car. And what I love about Dr. Acton is that instead of just making blind statements like 99% of the information you find out there, he used the scientific method to test all the possible parameters that go into building a Pinewood Derby car, and then he documented the results. Okay, so what did he learn after a year of testing? So here's a list of seven of the parameters he tested, and how many car lengths you would win by if you're able to perfect that specific parameter, assuming everything else was the same. So the first thing you should notice is by far the biggest contributor to increasing the speed of your car is maxing out the weight of your car at five ounces and then putting it in the right location towards the rear of the car. So that alone contributes to 36% of the speed of your car. And you would beat a car that had the worst possible mass placement location at the very front of the car by almost five car lengths if everything else was identical between your two cars. So why is this? Well, if you put all your weight toward the back of the car like this, when you're sitting on the track before you even start, your center of mass is higher up than if the weight was concentrated at the front of the car. That means you automatically start with more potential energy. And since energy is conserved and we added two blocks here, we have to add two blocks on the other side of the equation, which means you get more kinetic energy. And again, that's the energy of speed, which means you're going faster when you get to the bottom of the ramp. So another way to look at it is to say both cars will roll down the ramp at the same speed until they get to the bottom. Now at this point, the blue car is done accelerating, but the red car has all the mass at the back and is still falling 
and will continue to be pushed forward, sort of giving it a turbo boost when it gets to the flat part. So now the question remains, how far back should the mast be placed? Now if the mast is too far back, you're gonna pop a wheelie and be totally unstable, and clearly that's bad. So Dr. Acton ran trials on 40 cars, and he concentrated the mast in different locations on the car. And this chart is an example of the kind of data that he produced. So somewhere around 0.9 to 1.5 inches in front of the rear axle, gives you the best times. So if you want to narrow it down even more than that, it kind of depends on the shape of your car. The Dr. Acton went into more details into this in a video he made. It's like two hours long, it details all the results of his tests, and he even shows you like some tips and footage of how to actually fabricate the car. So if you want a lot more detail that I'm giving here, I highly recommend you check it out. I put a link to it in the description of this video. So let's quickly run through the remaining list of the critical parameters. Lightweight in the wheels can give you a two car length lead, everything else being equal. So if your race rules allow you, you need to take as much weight off this wheel as possible, especially the outer edge. Or just buy some that are done for you and I put a link in the video description of where you can get some. Now to explain why this matters, let's go back to our blocks. I didn't tell you the full story when it comes to kinetic energy. So remember, this is the energy of motion, and when you cross the finish line, technically you have two types of motion. Your car is translating, but the wheels are also rotating about the axis. Now that gives us rotational kinetic energy. Now this green pile of translating kinetic energy is still the most important, because that represents your car's speed. And this orange pile of the spinning wheels actually takes away from that. So if we can minimize the moment of inertia on each of the wheels by making it as light as possible around the edge, that means more of our initial potential energy will go into making our car go fast and not just spinning up the wheels with a lot of energy. So when you high center at the end, the wheels are just spinning forever. That's energy we could have used to make our car go fast. So the most streamlined Pinewood Derby car is going to beat a normal block of wood by about 1.4 car lengths if everything else is equal. Now going back to our blocks, when you're not very aerodynamic, it's basically just a form of friction. So essentially, the more streamlined your profile is, the fewer air molecules you basically have to push out of the way. So while you don't have to kill yourself here, making some attempt to make the car a little bit more streamlined than the standard block is gonna be worth it. So using polished axles will beat normal axles by about 1.3 car lengths, everything else being equal. I was actually surprised this wasn't a greater contributor to overall speed, but Dr. Acton ran 35 trials of different smoothness on the axles, and this is what the data showed. Interestingly, grooved axles are a complete waste of time and money. If you look at the formula for friction, it really just depends on the two materials of the surfaces rubbing together and sort of the weight at that surface. So even if you reduce your surface area by a factor of two, the overall weight acting at those surfaces is the same, so nothing changes. So lifting one wheel on your car, so your car is only riding on three wheels, will beat a four-wheeled car by about 1.1 car lengths, everything else being equal. And most people say, oh, with one less wheel, that's one-fourth the friction, but for the reasons we talked about, that's not true, because each wheel just has more weight on it. Now the real reason this actually helps goes back to our rotational kinetic energy. Now remember, the green pile is what you want to maximize, and if you have one less wheel to get spinning as you start going down the ramp, that means that energy gets to go to our kinetic energy of translation, which means a faster velocity at the finish line. And finally, adding graphite to your wheels and axles will make your car win by about 0.9 car lengths. Everything else being equal gets the car that has no graphite. Now there are several really expensive graphite solutions out there, but all the experts I talked to basically said, Graphite's graphite, that's clever marketing. Our independent tests show that there's really no appreciable difference between one versus another. So there's a number of other parameters Dr. Acton discusses in his videos, but those six are the ones that will have the biggest impact relative to the time you spend on your car. So in order to prove that science is true and to show that those six steps are really the best use of your time, on the day of our big race here, I decided to completely build a car from scratch in about 45 minutes and then take it to the competition and see how it did. So the first thing I did was just make a single cut in this block of wood. So remember, aerodynamics are important, but there's no need to totally kill yourself on it. Just a simple reduced shape is good. Okay, so the next step is polishing the axle. So here's a before and after. Basically, you just wanna take your axle, put it in a drill press or even a hand drill and duct tape down the trigger. And then you just take different levels of sandpaper and just dip them in water and, and put it on the nail. You, you go all the way from you know 600 to 2000 grit. The last step should be some sort of polishing compound. I put a link to another YouTube video that covers this in a lot more detail in the video description. And then I went ahead and marked the 12 o'clock position on the nail head, and this is why. So in doing research and talking with a bunch of experts, I actually found two things that Dr. Acton didn't test. These are the concept of rail riding and the concept of bending your axles so your wheels are canted. 
So let's start with bending the axles. So to bend the axles, I use this bending tool from Derby Works. So right there, you just bent the nail, then you take it out of the clamp, and then you have an uh, axle that's bent at exactly 2.5 degrees. So if you don't want to go to the hassle, you can actually buy pre-bent and pre-polished axles online. I put a link to where you can get them in the video description. So bent axles are important for two reasons. The first is that it reduces friction. And this is because as you roll down the track, the way the axles are bent, the wheels want to migrate outwards. And that's good because it reduces friction in the sense that the part that's rubbing is the wheel and the nail head, which has a much lower coefficient of friction than if the wheel's just bouncing around and rubbing against the wooden body of the car. The second reason they're really important is it makes alignment a hundred times easier. We'll get to that in a minute. And now I just put the wheels on the car, and this is a good time to apply the graphite. Just get it everywhere, you really can't over apply it. And now because we want our car to only ride on three wheels, I deepened one side of the pre-cut axle groove in the front. And now because it's deeper, that front left wheel won't touch the ground. So now you see I am just pushing these axles in by hand. I mean there are tools that sell for like $90 that help you align them. And people talk about drilling the holes just perpendicular, but it really doesn't matter if you're using canned axles. You just kind of put them in the pre-made slots, and then afterwards I just use a screwdriver just to make sure the nails were actually flush in each of those slots. And it doesn't matter because with the canon axles you can align it later. So this is where it leaves us at. The front left wheel is raised up off the ground. You can see the back two wheels are canted outwards, but you notice the front wheel is actually canted the opposite direction. Now this is the other thing Dr. Active didn't look at, but it was called the rail riding technique. Now rail riding means you intentionally steer your car into the rail that runs down the track and guides your car. Now that sounds crazy, like it's totally going to increase your friction, and a lot of experts recommend spending hours and hours on aligning your car so it runs perfectly straight. So the problem with that is no track has a perfect surface, so even the perfectly aligned car is going to bounce around on the track. So these bounces are incredibly detrimental because with each impact, you're taking some of your kinetic energy and it's being converted to friction and heat. And again, kinetic energy in this pile are the key to winning the race. So watch this slow-mo video of this rail rider car I built versus another car that actually ran pretty straight on a normal flat surface. And the key to the rail rider car is it turns toward the center rail, but just barely enough so it maintains contact with the rail. So here's how you set up the rail rider. So get yourself a nice flat board that's about four to six feet long, and your car should veer about one inch toward the side that has the wheel raised over the length of that board. So in this case, it veered too much, and this is the genius of the bent axles. Because to change direction, we don't have to shim or glue, all you do is twist the nail head. It doesn't take much, and then once I did that, it was just about right. So once again, if you want more information on the rail riding alignment process, I put a link in the video description that goes into a lot more depth. And then you also want to check the rear wheels just to make sure they are migrating outwards. You should see a little daylight between the wheel and the car body. And then again, if they're not, all you have to do is just get some pliers and twist the head of the axle. And so the final step is just getting our center of mass in the right spot. So I measure an inch in front of the rear axle. And then just to prove that ghetto is perfectly fine here, I'm using duct tape. And then you just kind of balance it on that line that we drew. You'll probably never get the balance exactly, just do enough to convince yourself that it's more or less in the right spot. Now there are actually some Pinewood Derby racing leagues held on a monthly basis for adults across the country. So I asked a few of the experts who run them, what do all the winning cars have in common? And the reason I took the two additional concepts of the rail rider and the canted wheel seriously is because they told me all of the cars that not only win but are entered have three things in common. They all ride on three wheels and not four, they all rail ride, and they all have canted wheels. Hey, rev your engines, gentlemen! So at the race, my buddy Mason won first place with an undefeated record in a field of 20 cars. He even beat my 40 mile an hour rocket car. Although that probably had more to do with the fact that my dumb friend Troy sabotaged my firing mechanism. Hey, Troy, I'm plugged in! Oh, okay. So in the rematch, I went straight for the jugular. Now Mason told me they spent at least 12 hours building this car, focusing on the huge list of things that supposedly you have to do everything for to have the fastest car. Now after the race, I asked to borrow his car, and once everybody left, I did a couple test runs. His undefeated 12 hour car against my 45 minute car. And this is the result.
In fact, my 45 minute car barely lost to this car of my buddies, and he's like an expert racer. In fact, this exact car has won many races, even at the district level. Okay, so in summary, I recommend maximizing the weight of your car at five ounces and placing it in the correct spot on the car, about an inch in front of the rear axles. Have a reasonably aerodynamic car and have it right on three wheels. Lightweight those wheels if your race rules allow it. And then get the bent polished axle so you can reduce your friction, make it a lot easier to align, and you can implement the rail riding technique. And then just run your rail rider alignment test and make sure you use plenty of graphite. So make sure you check out the links in the description for more detail on some of the steps I didn't cover fully. Plus if you want to save yourself a little time, I have some links there that show you where you get some of the stuff pre-made, like the bent polished axles. So this video is way longer than I typically like to make my videos, but hopefully you found it helpful. So above all, I hope you guys have fun and you use this as an opportunity to get excited about science and physics. And then you use that to turn around and just dominate every other car in the race.